Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Jonas Club Management Event Management Overview Webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah, I'll be hosting this webinar today. Just wanna go over a couple of things before we get started. Uh, so you've probably already noticed but your phones are muted. Uh, if you do have any questions for me throughout the presentation, please go ahead and use the chat box or there is a Q&A box that you could use. Uh, you can access those by hovering your mouse at the top of the screen. A little toolbar should pop down and then you can click on either chat or Q&A. Uh, from there, you can send me a chat privately or you can send a chat that everybody can see. I will try to answer the questions as I see them, but with webinars such as these ones where we do have a high volume of questions coming in and a lot of people following along, I do not always get to see them right away. So if I do see them and I do feel that it's relevant to what we're talking about, I will try to answer it. If not, I will have time to answer all of your questions at the end. So if you don't get an answer right away, don't feel like I'm ignoring your question. I will definitely answer it. It's just a matter of when. Um, so you probably also heard that the recorder has started. So a copy of the session will be available online to download in a PDF version as well as as a YouTube video. So you can find both of those things at jonassupport.com and I will repeat that address at the end of the session as well. Uh, the PDF slides will be available where you signed up for this webinar under resources and training and then club continuing education. The video will be available under resources and training as well, but under the video library section. So what do you expect from this webinar? We're, it's approximately 50 minutes of information uh, with 10 minutes for question and answer at the end. We do find that this one runs a little bit longer because there's so much information and there are usually a lot of questions. Um, I have no problem going over time for questions, so if you do have a question for me um, and it doesn't get answered in the hour, I will not stop the webinar until we get all of your questions answered. Um, and webinars, just as a note, are there just to enhance your knowledge of Jonas? So it's to be used as a refresher or to be used as um, just kind of a tips and tricks helpful hint session. We do expect that you do have a base knowledge of the Jonas system and by extension the activity management system before taking this webinar. Okay, so event management. Um, under the event management option, we'll, this is what we'll be going through. So we'll look at booking or billing for private functions and registered events. What it does is it links to your Jonas, your core Jonas point of sale. So we'll look at billing items and different links for that. Um, it allows you to bill private functions for members and non-members, and it also allows you to do registered events, which means that your members can actually buy tickets or register themselves for different events that you might have at your club. Um, and that, that part can actually be integrated to your club's website. So we'll go through some of your setups first. So these are some of the things that you'll need before using the event management program. Um, outside of activity management, so this is within your core Jonas program, what you'll need is both point of sale sales categories as well as sales items. So the sales items are actually used to create billable things for both private functions as well as registration events. So what you'll need is a sales item for each food offering you have, every bar offering you have, all of the things that you charge for, um, any of the ticket prices that you do, so if you do charge tickets for events. You also need sales items to bill for facility fees, for any rentals, um, pretty much everything that gets billed within the activity management program. Uh, you will need to do for, for as a sales item, sorry. Um, those sales items are all tied to point of sale sale categories. Sales categories have different options, um, but the category actually determines where the sales item is eligible to be billed for. So the sales category will tell you uh, whether or not it's a pricing item, so it's a ticket, if it's food, if it's beverage, if it's other services, if it's a facility, or if it's a resource. So you have all different kinds of sales categories, and those categories actually determine what kind of module you have or what, what kind of item it is. Okay, so uh, from your sales category setup, you'll go to point of sale, system setup, sales categories. Under the other modules tab is where you'll mark this category as eligible for event management. So you can see all the different options here. Uh, the event ones are closer to the bottom, but you do have your other activity management modules. 
Uh, this is where you would mark each category as event food, beverage, pricing, which is your tickets for events, uh, facility charge, resources, or any other services you might offer. So those categories need to be marked as eligible, and the sales items need to be pointing to that category in order for those to be able to be used in activity management. So hopping over into the actual activity management module, so once you have those two things set up, you can go in and start your setups within activity management. So under event management, there are a couple of things that you must have. So the first one is an activity type. Activity type is just your general description of the events and where they can be booked. So typically clubs will have an activity called member events and an activity called private parties or banquet functions. Um, you also need employees and employee groups. So employees are people that who are people that can be booked or assigned to events. So you'll have an employee staff, an employee profile set up for all of the staff who are event coordinators, who are event salespeople. Um, anyone who can be booked for an event needs to have an employee profile. So both of those setups, activity types and employee employee groups, are under the system administration tab. So within activity management, you'll go to system administration. The first one is, of course, activity types, and then the second one is your staff groups or staff or employee profiles. Um, the staff profiles are different from your user profile, so you have your users that can actually log into activity management. Those users can be linked to their individual staff profiles, or you can have standalone staff profiles. Just because somebody has a profile in activity management does not mean that they have a login. So that means that you can have a profile for all of your banquet servers, even though maybe they will never come in and actually edit an event. You can just assign them to work at the event. The next thing that you need are seating styles. So seating styles basically are how the party will be set up. So you could have one for a classroom style, ceremony style, 10 rounds, cocktail style. And they're just a kind of a general description so that you do not have to type for every single event how you want the room set up. We also have, and I will go over this in more detail when we get into the facility, um, we also have the option now to create layouts. So these are physical representations of how you want the room set up. Uh, the next thing that you'll need are task groups. So task groups are just reminders of things to do for an event that you can actually attach to individual events. The groups could be as simple as you have one group called event tasks, or they could be as detailed as these are setup tasks these are maintenance tasks, these are things to do during the event. You can have all different kinds of groups. And then you assign them to each event, and you can say what the actual individual task is. So an example of a task group would be facility setups, and an example of the task would be to send the linens to laundry. The last thing you need is event stages. So stages are basically a way for you to look at an event report and know what is coming up, what has been canceled, and what has been completely billed and closed. So stages, you need to have one for canceled, completed, and open. So canceled, of course, means that the event has been canceled. Completed means that it's done and it's been built. And open just means that you can have one uh, that just means that this event is happening. You can also split open into tentative and confirmed, which is very common. Uh, event stages tell you, so the each individual stage allows you to reserve the facility or stop the registration. So if you have a canceled stage, you will mark that stage as definitely reserve the facility um, and definitely stop registration. If you have a completed stage, the facility, of course, does not need to be reserved anymore and registrations definitely need to be stopped. And then the open stage, you'll want both of those things as well. So it's just uh, different options depending on how you run your calendar. Um, so you definitely need to have three stages. You can have many stages. I've seen clubs that have, you know, 10 to 12 different stages for their events. So those things are your essentials. You must have them in order to complete, to go into the really big setups. So these are just the little things that, little details that you need to make sure that you have. The next thing that you need to set up is a facility. So every event needs a facility, and this is the location where the event is happening. And it kind of tells you what type of activity can be booked into that facility as well. So you could have facilities for your patio, your dining room, your ballroom, and maybe in those facilities you only host certain types of events. You can definitely filter those out. Um, when you book, when you create your facilities, you need to say what type of seating styles can be used. So if you remember the seating styles that we set up are 
for example, things like classroom, rounds of 10, cocktail style. You've determined those, so now what you'll do is go ahead and attach them to the individual facilities so that you have just the ones that are actually available in that facility available to you when you go ahead and book an event. The last thing you need for facilities would be the price to book the room. So if it's zero, if you don't charge for your facility rentals, you can leave it at zero, but you do still need a billing item and you need to put a zero in there. If you do charge a price, you definitely need a billing item, and that billing item comes from our very first step, which was the point of sale sales item called room rental or facility rental. So this is what the facility setup screen looks like. You can find this under system administration and then facilities. You have your general information, so you'll give your facility a description. Uh, you'll give it a display name. So the display name shows when you're actually looking at your event for the day. It breaks it out by facilities. So the display name is just a shorter way because sometimes the facility name is a little bit too long to fit into those columns. And then you also have your display sort. So display sort is a totally optional option. It allows you to show certain facilities first. So when you're looking at your facilities for the day, you might have a really long list and you'll have to scroll through. The display sort allows you to place some first, some second, some third. So you have your first priority facilities first and then you can drop some else into the lower end of the list. You can restrict this facility uh, by gender. So this, less important for events, unless you're doing registration events, but what it is is if you have a men's grill, you will restrict it to men. And then that way when they're registering, only men can register and not women, so you don't have to uh, go ahead and remove people from your events or monitor the gender of your registrants. The default sales area, so keep in mind, Facilities are shared between all activity management modules. So the default sales area, if you're only using the event management module, can definitely be events. But if you're using spa, court booking, uh, dining reservations, any of those other modules, what you'll need to do is make sure that the default sales area would be the one that's used the most. And then you can override the sales area based on module. You have the option to allow multiple. So what that means is if you have a facility maybe called golf course, golf courses are huge, you can allow multiple events to be booked at one time. Outdoor facility is purely for information, and then active, of course, means that this facility is active and eligible to be booked. The other option you have under the general tab is called sub-facilities. So what that means is you could have a facility created called ballroom, but if you, your club has a partition that splits into ballroom A and ballroom B, for example, you set up all three things, so you'll set up ballroom, ballroom A, and ballroom B, and then you'll note that ballroom A and ballroom B are sub-facilities of the main ballroom. That way, when there's an event booked in, say, ballroom B, you can't book the main ballroom because half of it is already booked. You can, however, still book ballroom A. So sub-facilities just allow you to restrict uh, certain facilities, so if one's booked, the other one can't be booked. Once you have your general information set up for your facilities, you'll head on over to the event management tab, and you just have to check the box at the very top here. This facility can be reserved for events. Then you have your parameters open up for all the different uh, event options we have for facilities. So the second screen here in general just asks you for the sales area to use. So if this is going to be different from the default sales area, when this facility is booked for an event, this is the sales area I'd like to use, which is my events sales area. Then you have your different event types. You will check off what event type is eligible for this facility. Then you can head into the next tab, which is seating styles. This is where you'll add all of those different seating styles that we added in the first step as eligible for this room. So for this facility, we have four seating styles that we could do, as well as a maximum number of attendees. So if I'm setting up as 10 rounds, I can only have an event with 80 people. Then you'll head into the tasks. So tasks just means that when this facility is used, this task will be assigned to the event. So linen order, we have to order this linen. We need to make sure that this is done so it's added as a task to each event. The next tab is activity types. So this is where you'll we, uh, this is where you'll assign each activity to the facility. So we set up activities in the very first step. You can find that under system administration activity types. 
these are the activities that we set up, and then we'll just say all three of these can be used in the ballroom. The last tab is pricing. So pricing is where you would assign the budget category. So if you are using the budgeting feature of event management, you would assign this as probably a facility budget category. Uh, the billing item, so this is the sales item that came from the core Jonas system. And then the pricing, so if it's a member, it's gonna cost 150. If it's a retail or if it's a non-member or a guest, it'll cost 250. So just a side note, um, it, this is actually fairly recent now. What you can do for your events is set up facility layouts. So you can set, out, set up an actual default layout per facility and you can also set this up per event. So you can have a different layout per event or per facility. What you'll do is maybe create the layout of the room as is. And then when you go into the individual event, you can edit the layout to be exactly how you want it. So the layout is really just a physical representation of the room. What you need for the facility layout feature is to go to event management and then table types. And you'll need to create a table type for each kind of table that your club has. So that's, for example, you know, we have 12 top circles, we've got bar stools, we have uh, four top rectangles, we've got card tables. So everything that you have to offer that could go on a layout needs to be created here. So what you'll do is go to event management and then table types. You will click on new and then give your table type a description and then how many seats it has. So this one, for example, has 12. Then you'll go to the table layout feature, and that's this screen here, and it will actually allow you to show exactly how this table looks. So for example, this is a 12 top circle. I have a round table with 12 seats around it. I added those seats by clicking on this plus right here, and I adjusted the width and height down here with these little meters. You can also change the texture and the color of the chairs as well as the table. So create little physical tables. Every single kind of table that you have at your club, you will create here. A side note, if you, do, if you are using the dining reservations module, these table types are shared. So you might already have it if you are using the dining reservations module. Once you have your table types in there, you can go to actually create your facility layout, which is event management facility layout. You'll see all my different table types along the side here. All I have to do to get them in is click and drag onto my layout. So this is my, my restaurant here with all my different uh, tables on it. So this is how I'd like my facility to normally be set up. Those layouts can be attached to facilities to be used as a default. Or in the actual individual event setup, you can attach a, a, a specific layout for the event. So what that means is you can actually create one custom for the event and print it out so that you know exactly how it's going to be set up and it saves you from having to write a paragraph of instructions to your staff to tell them exactly how you need to set it up. So the next thing you need is resources. So resources for events are things that can be rented with bookings. So it could be something, something that the club already has. So it's things like AV equipment, linen rentals, uh, microphones, podiums, screens, things like that. Um, what you can do with resources is actually track their availability. So when you're setting up a resource, you can tell Jonas exactly how many you have. And then uh, what you do is check the box that says track availability, and that will actually track it. So as it gets booked for events, if you have a couple of events happening on the same day and you've used up, say, your two microphones, a third microphone can't be rented because the club just doesn't have it. So this is the resources setup screen. You can find this at system administration and then resources. Under the general tab, what you need is a description, of course, and then a quantity. So flip chart and markers, we have two available to us. And then the quantity is two, and then you just check off track availability. So what that means is once two have been booked, if I go in to book a third event, it actually won't allow me to book a flip chart. From here, you'll go into the event management tab, which is right here. You will check off what facilities this resource is eligible for. So maybe we can only bring those things to certain rooms. 
And then you can go to the task screen and actually attach tasks. So if you are attaching the resource of flip chart and markers, this task, check marker avail inventory, will be attached to the event so you know to check that before the event and it can ensure that you can offer markers to your client. Then you'll go to the pricing tab and pricing allows you to set just a standard price for this. Uh, first, you need the budget category if you are using the budget feature. Then you need the billing item. And again, this billing item comes from your core Jonas program. It's just a sales item. You can have one sales item per resource, or you can have just one sales item called resources and use it for all of your different rentals. Um, you'll give this a price. So if you are charging your members for these rentals, you will say what the price, the default price is. You can override this per event if you need to. So the next thing that we're going to go over setup wise is your event types. So these are all of the different standard events that your club may offer. The event types determines the event format. So whether it's a private event or it's a registration event. So a registration event just means it's where your members will actually register themselves and buy tickets or pay per head. Um, it also allows you to show what stages are available for each event type. So all events have stages. They have opened, they have completed, and they have canceled. We set up our stages in that um, third slide where we just went over some of the stuff to do first. So the stages are things like tentative, confirmed, completed to be billed, completed and billed, canceled. You can set up as many stages as you want and attach them to individual event types as needed. Then you have employees. So you'll say what employees can be booked for what event type. Um, and you need at least one employee to book an event, so make sure if you aren't going to assign employees individually to each event server-wise, you do definitely need the event coordinator or whoever is booking the event in there as an employee so that somebody can be attached. Then you'll do your standard tasks. So if you are using the task tracking feature, you will go ahead and put in what tasks come default with these events. Any extra info, so extra info are basically custom fields. It allows you to ask questions that maybe aren't standard for an event. So you can have extra info for the client who's hosting, or you can have extra info for the registrant. And these are things on top of what is your member number, how many guests are you bringing, uh, what food is required, and what resources are we using for your event. So these could be things such as for a registration event, maybe you could ask them chicken or steak um, for a Private event, if it's a wedding, you could ask things more specific that wouldn't be uh, included as a standard field. Then you have a tab called facilities, and this is where you'll mark off what facilities each event type can be, can happen in. And then also the checklist info. So if you are setting up checklists for each type of event, you'll attach the default checklist for these. So this is the event types setup screen, and this is under event management and then event types. Of course, the first thing you need is under the general tab, and you'll notice this is the pattern. You need a description. And then you'll attach the event types to their groups as well as their format. So banquet, conference, or meeting, what that means is there's one person paying, one member is associated, it gets billed to that one person. Registered events, which is the second screen here, registration required, means that to be able to actually build this event, you need to have members either registering themselves or you need to be registering your members as they call in. So a registered event would be something like a summer barbecue that you're hosting for your club and they pay maybe 20 bucks and they get a hot dog and a beer. Um, a banquet conference or meeting would be exactly any of those things, a wedding, a private function. You'll see when you select registration required that the event type details for the club actually opens up. And this is where you tell Jonas for this type of event, do we need to identify the registrant? So does everybody who registers need to have either a member number or a name, a guest name in there? You'll also show the default registration screen. Uh, you have the option of quick registration or the regular registration screen, and we will look at both of those uh, when we get into the more processing side of things. And then your default weight priority. So you do have the option for registration events to assign them to a wait list. The next tab is stages, and this tab is the same for both types of events. This is where you'll pull over all of your different stages that are eligible for this type. 
You can do them all, or you can do just certain ones for certain types of events. My advice to you is they are in alphabetical order here, which typically means that cancel comes first. Pull them over in the order that you'd like to see them. So pre-open would be like a tentative stage. Confirmed would be confirmed. Completed means that it's done and build, and then put canceled at the bottom. The reason being when you actually open up for a new event, it just defaults to the first one on the list. If the first one on the list is canceled, all of the events that you put in will say that they're canceled right away. So definitely pull them over so you can dr click and drag, or you can double click on the different ones you want over here, which is the screen that actually determines which ones are eligible. I uh, just want to make sure that you are doing that in the order that you'd like to see them as opposed to an alphabetical order. Otherwise, all of your events will be by default canceled. The next tab is staff. So this is where you can assign what staff are eligible to cover this type of event. You can put in, again, all of your staff, or you can put in just one person who's probably the main contact, your events manager or coordinator. Um, you just want to make sure that you have at least one person eligible. Otherwise, you will not be able to save your event when you're going to book it. Tasks is the next step, and we have looked at this one a couple of times now. It's the exact same. You just give a description of any default tasks that come with this event, uh, what group it's in, when this task should be completed by, and whether or not it's active or if it's a high priority, you can assign it to that. So for a wedding, for example, the task could be contact bride and find out her color scheme or order flowers. The next tab is extra info. Extra info are just things that uh, you would ask a registrant or you would ask a banquet client that aren't a default for the event. So it's something beyond where the event's happening, what services they want, what rentals they need, and if they have a member number or not. So you can see here we have meal. So this could be a registrant. So if they need a meal or if they are bringing their own food, they would check that off. Uh, we have a couple of other checkboxes here. So you have different options for the extra info. You can have a checkbox, you can have a list, you can have just like a free form entry so the member can type in their answer. Um, but it's basically just custom fields. If you're familiar with the custom fields you can use in club management, same thing. If you are doing a registration event, the registrant extra info tab will open up and it looks the exact same as the event extra info. It just depends on what type of event it is. Then you have your facilities. This is where you check off what facility each event type can happen in. So if you have, for example, a wedding, you'll probably check off everything except for the badminton court, because I don't know many people who want to get married on a badminton court. Um, if you're having, say, a golf tournament, you'll probably uncheck your restaurants and your ballroom because the golf tournament is typically outside. So try to keep this as filtered as possible, and that way it makes it a little bit easier when you're entering events. You don't have this big, long list of things to select from. The next option is checklist info. And checklists aren't something that we go over in the setup of, of this webinar, just uh, for the sake of time. But what you can do is have checklists in your activity management system and assign them to different events. So the difference between checklist and extra info, extra info will happen with every single event that goes on with this type. Checklist, you have the option of attaching or not attaching. And then the last tab is forms. So this is where you would set up your default contract, invoice, function sheet, event order uh, for each different type of event. So if you have a wedding contract versus a meeting contract, you would set that up here. Uh, your forms are designed, pre-designed, there are some standard ones in there or you can go ahead and actually customize your forms. So this is where you would just select the ones that are custom for your club. The next setup that we need once you have your event types are your service types. So services in events are things like your food, your bar, something that the club is billing for but doesn't, isn't necessarily renting for the event. Um, so this is basically a description of how the items will be served. So you can have services called breakfast, you can have plated service, you can have buffet, you can have open bar. Once you have your service type in there and set up, 
you'll check off what sales categories are eligible for this service. So if you have a food service, you'll check off all the categories that are food. If you have a beverage, you'll check off all your beverage. If you have any other open services like valet parking, you'll check off those categories. Um, this just helps to keep it clean when you're entering in your events so that when you're going to put services and attach them to your events, you don't have a big long list of every single uh, sales item that you have in there that's eligible for your events. So this is what the service type screen looks like. It's under event management, service types. You'll put in your description. You also have the option to allow transfers from POS. So what that means is the day of the event, the server can actually ring up a big long chit. Uh, it's typically used for consumption bars. So they'll ring up every single drink that was ordered. Then you just have to place a button on your menu that says transfer to jam event. And what it will do is transfer all of those items and dump them into the services tab of the event. So that chit does not get charged separately to the member's account. It all gets put into one big event order. So you can allow those transfers or you can not allow transfers for this type of service. Then you'll go to the sales item categories tab and this is where you'll check off just the different kinds of items. And these all come from your core Jonas program that are eligible for this service. So in this case, it's beverage service, so we've only checked off bottled beer and draft beer, and I assume there will be more checked off if I scroll down. The next thing that you can set up are event menus. So event menus are basically your library of service items with the description and their sales items. So it makes it a little bit faster if you offer, for example, packages. So if you have a package um, say it's a barbecue buffet, and it always includes hot dogs, hamburgers, assorted salads, uh, dessert station, french fries, bottled pop. You can attach them all to the menu, and then attach that menu to a booking, and it saves you from having to enter in all of those sales items individually. So for example, here we're, we have set up the event menu of Continental Breakfast. This includes these three sales items. Every time I attach Continental Breakfast to an event, it will actually attach these three sales items for me. So I don't have to worry about doing that each time. If you have packages where maybe it's like a choose four of these five, you can actually go ahead and put, put them all in and then for each event, add them and then just delete the lines the member didn't choose. So event menus is set up under event management and then it's called event menus. It's just a button up in your ribbon. So the next thing is the budgeting tab. So budgeting is, it's completely optional. It's not something that you need to use, but it is a really helpful tool. It's basically a forecast for the cost of the event. So it gives you the ability to put in all of your costs, put in your expected revenues, and uh, look at a, a real profit and loss for each event. The budgeting information shows up on one of the reports, so you can see it for all of your events, or you can see it for just individual events per event. So you need budgeting categories first. So you can set up categories that are as detailed as beer, liquor, wine, or you can set up categories that are a little bit more broad, so you can have one for beverage, one for food, one for labor, and one for facilities. You'll give your category a description, and then your reporting type. So your options here are beverage, food, facility, other services, and resources. And then your costing method, so how, how you'd like this budget to be cost. If you go to the sales item categories, you can actually check off what items are eligible for this category. So it really just, what it's asking you there is what items make up each line on your budget report. The costing method, you can put in as a manual entry if you'd want, or you can do it just as a percentage of sales. So you, if you want to use this tool as very general, but you don't want to get into the detail of having to attach every single cost to every single item, you can do it just as a percentage, so on average 25% cost on beer. The next option is standard phrases. And standard phrases, again, is under event management, and then it's just a button called standard phrases. It'll be in your setups options. Uh, these are things that are repeatedly entered. So these are things like your policies, um, any kind of dress codes, your cancellation policy, 
any kind of disclaimers. So you can set up standard phrases. So instead of having to type this description every single time, you would set it up once as a standard phrase. And then when you're actually entering your events in the notes field, if you just right click your mouse, you have an option of selecting those standard phrases and it will actually populate with the description that you've typed in. You only have to type it once and you can attach it to each event. The next tab is pricing codes. And again, this is under event management. And if it's on your ribbon, it's a little gold circle called pricing codes. If it's not on your ribbon, it'll be under the setups menu and it's just called pricing codes. So these are the different types of prices for registered events. So you can have them really broad and say adult, child, guest, and senior, or you can have them very specific per event. These are basically just what your members are paying to be able to register and come to club events. So again, under event management and then pricing codes, we have the description. You'll give your POS item, so what item you're using to sell these different pricing codes. And then you can actually classify this by age. You don't have to, it's definitely not required. Uh, it's just an option for you to make it a little bit easier to register members. You can also automatically apply pricing codes based on different ages. So the ages are determined in the member's profile if they have a birthday on file. You can actually have it automatically assign a member their pricing code so they don't even get the option to register as an adult child, et cetera. So you can set maximum ages for different pricing codes if you'd like. So that is pretty much all of the setup that you'll need for event management. I will go over how to find some of these things right now, so I'm just going to open up my event management program. So most of it is under event management. We have our event types. We have our service types. We have our event menus. We have the checklist setup. We have our seating style. So seating styles is, again, how the events are set up, rounds, tables, classroom style. The facility layouts have actually been dropped in right here. So this is where you'll set up your individual tables. And this is where you'll set up the actual layout for the facility. Then I have some things that are missing that we went over. So if I can't see them, I'll either go to additional options and then setups, which is right here. And you can see I have my budget categories. I have my standard phrases. I have different stages for my events. Um, I have my different task groups, my different event types, as well as my waitlist priorities. So you can either find it on your ribbon. If you're not seeing it on your ribbon, go to additional options and then setups, Oops. and it should be all there. We also went over, if you go to the system administration tab, facilities. We also looked at users and staff and forms. And some of the things, again, are not there, so I'll go to my additional options and my setups. I have my activity types, which we did go over. Um, I have my resources, and then I also have my staff. These are staff profiles, so these are people that can be assigned to different events. So if it's not in your ribbon, look at the additional options. Go to setups, and then you can find all of our options right here. Okay. Okay, so we'll get into some of our event setup now. We're going to start with registration events. So to set up a registered event, you need to know when the event is, where the event is and how you'd like it set up, what type of, inf of event it is, whether or not you need to know exactly who's coming or just numbers, when the registration opens and closes, and this is for online as well, what the price of the event is, and who is the employee associated with the booking. Those are the things that you need to know. You will not be able to save your event unless you have this information. So you need the date and the time, you need the facility, you need the type, you need the parameters for registration, so whether or not I need to give you my member number right away, or if I can just say I'm a member and I'm coming, as well as any guests that I'm bringing. We have our pricing tab, which is I need to know how much it's going to cost, and I need to know for offering adult versus child pricing. And then I need to know who's in charge of this, who's a responsible booker. The optional information would be the banquet event order, so what food is going to be offered at this event. 
the employees who are actually working the event, any checklists or tasks that will be associated, as well as the resources, so the, the club resources or rentals that will be offered. That's optional. So to register members for an event, you can add members and guests. Uh, you can use the quick registration, so only the person who is booking is required to be identified. So what that means is all you have to do is put in the actual member number and say this member is bringing two members and two guests. Or you can book with the registrant identification screen. So this is everybody needs to be identified. So if I'm a member and I'm bringing two other members and two other guests, I need to give you the two other members' member numbers. I need to give you my guest information as well. This is your event registration screen. When you go to register members for the event, this is what you'll see. Starting at the top, you'll see what kind of event it is, and you can actually have multiple events on this screen, so you can be registering members for multiple events at the same time if you'd like. This is step one, make sure you have the correct event, so this is our wine and cheese night. Step two, select the registrants for the selected event. So this is the quick registration screen here. I've given my booking owner, who is uh, member number 11, and I've said that he is bringing four members, no guests. I don't need to, I don't need to identify those other three members. Um, it gives me his total cost. If this is correct, I've confirmed it, I will go down and click on either register and continue or register and close. So register and continue just means I'm gonna keep registering members, keep me here. Register and close means I'm done, exit out, I'm, I wanna do something else. Once he's registered, you'll see up at the top, these are all of our registrations. So we see Robert Smith here, he's my booking owner. And then we have client two, three, and four. They have not been identified, but he said that they're coming. So I have four people registered um, and they're listed up here. Come on. If you don't like the quick registration screen or your club requires that you identify each person coming to the event, what you'll do is go to the registrant identification screen. Put in all of the members. So in this case, we have member number 35 and 36. And then we have two guests. They're bringing two guests with them. I've decided that John Ackerman is going to be responsible for this registration. So even though I've identified one other member and two other guests, he's going to be the one paying for everybody. If you check off the responsible box, they will all pay for themselves. Then you'll click on again, either register and continue or register and close. And they will be added to our list. So you can see now we have our four other registrants. We have one, two people that are guests and then they're all under the same booking number. Once you have all of your event registrants on the event and you're ready to bill, what you can do is go ahead and auto charge. So you can actually create chits for the event by clicking on auto charge. You have the option to close them all or you can leave them open. And you also have the option to create a separate chit per client or per reservation. So even though I registered in my first example, Robert, Acker, Robert Ackerman, and he's member 11, he registered himself and three other people but didn't identify them. It's assumed that he will be paying for them, but if he's not, you can separate out those chits and they can pay for themselves by cash, credit card, member charge, however they need to, because it just creates a regular chit in your point of sale system um, as if you had rung it up at the point of sale. You can also do selected registrants. So this will launch the POS and create chits. You still have the option to create separate per client or per reservation, uh, but in this case, you've selected only certain people. So maybe you're billing people as they show up as opposed to billing everybody at the same time. In that case, you would use the launch POS option. If you're doing everybody at once, you just, you just wanna get them in and get them out, you'll click on auto charge. So when you click on auto charge on the billing screen, it will take you to this screen first, which is kind of your parameters. It gives you all of the different people on this event, whether or not they've been checked in and whether or not they've been already billed, which is what will check off the paid option. 
Then you have your options here. So create chit dated. So this is when uh, you'd like to have that selling date. So typically it's going to be the day of the event. You have the option to print a copy of each chit. So if each member has to sign for themselves before they leave, that's how you would do that. You could print a copy. You have the option to assign chits to a certain server, or you could assign it to your supervisor and have them assign out the chits based on who's taking care of whom. And then you have options. So chit creation option, uh, you have automatically close all chits. So what this does is it creates the chit, it member charges it, and it closes it. So all you have to do is do an end of day update. You also have the option to create chits and leave them open. So all of those chits will be sitting in your point of sale. If the member comes to the event and maybe adds drinks or adds additional food to their order, you can add it to that chit and everything's on one order. And then you have your separate chit per client versus per reservation. So if you did per client, it would bill all of these lines individually. If you did per reservation, it would create one chit for each booking number. So all four of these people would be on one person's bill. From here, you'll just click on Create Chits. It does give you a little summary here. We're going to create two chits with a total amount of $420. This creates them all, and depending on your option, will member charge and close them or leave them open. You can also just hit Save and Close, so you've saved your parameters, but you're not ready to actually open them yet. Or you can hit Exit and just get out of here. So you can get to this screen from the actual registration screen. Um, the other option is the launch POS option. So it's two different buttons. The first one is auto charge. The second one is launch POS. Auto charge does everybody. Launch POS just does certain members. So in this case, we've checked off just the members in booking number two. Clicked on launch POS, and I will show you that button. And then uh, what, what happens is we have a similar parameter screen. Uh, we can have the option to create individual chits or one for just the people that we've selected. And then you'll click on Launch POS. Does the same thing, takes you to your point of sale, creates an open chit, uh, but you don't have the option to automatically member charge and close it. You do have to do that manually on your menu. So the difference between the two options, uh, it's just two different, two different um, buttons that you'll push. So the, this is your registration screen. The first button is this one, which is the auto charge POS. It's a little bit more modern, it's faster, it looks like a little touch screen phone. Um, that one will do everybody. The second one is this old style cash register. That will do just one person that you've selected. So launch POS just does the one person or group. Auto charge does everybody. Okay. Um, once you have those chits created for your registration events, it's really just doing an end of day update and it's just like a regular point of sale day. Um, you'll see it go onto the member's account and you'll see it post to your GLs. At that point, the event will be closed. Moving on from registration events, we'll go into our private functions. So private functions, to set that up, what you need to know is who is the person to bill for the event, when is the event, where is it happening, what type of event is it, is it, and who's the contact for this or who's the event coordinator. Once you have that stuff in, you are able to save the event, but you will have to go back in and add your services and your resources to the booking to actually create an accurate BEO. So on your private function detail screen, when you open it up, you'll have a number of options. The first thing you need when you're creating an event, of course, Give it a name, give it a type, and give it a date and time. And this is the same for registration events as well. Um, of course, the type will be different for registration events. Uh, in this case, it's just a birthday celebration. Um, and then the first tab that you have is the summary tab. So these tabs are pretty much in order, so you should be going following them in order to enter in your events, except for the other tab. That one you might be back and forth between. So the first tab is the summary. It gives you by facility what services and what resources are happening in that facility. Then it gives you a little financial summary as well. So the facilities, the food, the beverage, the other, and the resources, with their taxes and their service charges and their gratuities, and then a total. It gives you a grand total for the event, 
shows you any deposits or payments that have been made, and then it gives you the balance due at the very bottom. So this is really just a quick look at the status of this event. From there, you will go to the client info tab and just attach the member number or the guest information. So client info is basically just who's hosting this event. And then you'll assign your facility. So your facility, of course, is where the event is happening. Each event, in order to be booked and accurately booked, needs services. So the service entry screen is twofold. There's two spots to put things in. There's one at the top, which is where you'll select your service type, which we set up at the very beginning. Um, so the service type basically tells you what kind of services are going to be under here. So whether or not it's your plated dinner, your buffet dinner, your open bar, your consumption bar, um, where it's happening. So you assign each service type to a facility and when, so what time. The default will be the whole event. So if it's an event from five to midnight, you will see the service listed from five to midnight. You can edit it, so on your BEO, you have a little bit more detail. So maybe dinner is from five to seven, then we'll have cocktails from seven to nine, and then from seven to midnight, we'll have orders walking around and open bar. Once you have your service type in there, you'll move to the bottom section, and I will show you a visual of this, to actually add the individual sales items to your service. So you need the description of the item, you need the quantity, and you can actually override the price based on each individual item. So this is a service entry screen. You'll see up at the top, I have three different kinds of service types. These service types house different services down at the bottom. So right now I'm looking at past hors d'oeuvres, uh, which is going to be the Mediterranean seafood hors d'oeuvres. If I had clicked on open bar, it would actually change what appears down here. You have two options to enter in your services. You can do the individual sales items one by one using this list. Or if you click on item selector, it's a little bit faster, it shows you all of the items and then you just double click on the ones that you want. Pure preference, I've seen it about 50-50 who you'd like to use what, but two different ways to enter in your services there. The next thing you need for your events are your resources. So your resources, it looks the same, the entry screen, but you have the option for your groups to actually type it in as you wish. So you do not have to have preset resource types. You can just type in one line that says resources, or you can have different things such as AV equipment, rentals, um, decorations. Depends on how you want it organized on your BEO. So you'll add your group first, and then you'll add your specific resource. So this is what a resource tab would look like. Uh, up top, we've typed in audiovisual. Down below, we've added the projector and the screen. So if you remember, when we set up our resources, uh, you had the option of saying how many were available. So here is where we say one is available and I'm reserving one. Same with the screen, one's available and I'm reserving one. If I was to go in and actually book another event, I wouldn't be able to add these resources because they're already booked. The next thing that you'll want to look at for your events are the forms. So you have your contracts, you have your event orders, your invoices, and your function sheets, as well as any other forms that your club might have that are, are more specific. So these forms are typically designed per club. So we have some standard ones in there. But what you could do is add your logo, add your own wording, change the structure of them, depending on what your club's needs are. From here, you can preview the form. So you can, as you're putting in event stuff, you can actually preview the event order, preview the function sheet. You can print them, which sends it straight to a printer, or you can email them. So you can actually email from here the invoice to the member, as long as the member has an email listed under client info. So once you have uh, your private events in the system, you do have to go ahead and bill them. So two different ways to bill events. You'll take your payments and your deposits throughout the, the planning of the event. So these are applied against the total when you actually go ahead and bill. The amounts will post to the payment item general ledger and the payment or deposit holding account. So you've already predefined those two things. The payment and deposit holding account is set up in the event settings, which is under event management event settings. 
the uh, payment item general ledger is actually set up in the core donors program and it's under the activity management menu option at the very bottom of your main menu. So this is where you'll say what general ledger accounts it goes to when a member pays by check, cash, MasterCard, or member charge. When you post a payment or a deposit, it will make the entry to the holding account as well as to the payment item general ledger. When you actually go in to bill the function, it will move the amount from the holding account to the, to the uh, revenue accounts for the event. So billing private functions, once you have your payments in there and you're happy with the event, it's done, it's perfect, you've billed the member, you can actually go in and post it to their account or you can go in and bill the event and post it to your revenue account. So every event needs to be billed. You do have some options when you're billing. So you'll notice when you go to the billing tab that you have either a pre-post or a final post. The pre-post is purely optional. You do not have to use it. It's just a tool that some accountants like. Basically what it does is it posts revenues and taxes, but it does not post to the member's account and it does not post to your AR. Why would you want this? Maybe the event happened at the very end of the month. You want to recognize the revenue and the taxes in the month that the event happened, but you've promised a member that maybe it won't show up on their statement until the next month. So the event's on March 31st. The member says, I'm going to get a statement tomorrow. I don't want to pay this right away. You'll say, okay, great. It's going to be on your May statement. You can pre-post the event so that your financials and your revenues are correct. And then you can go in and final post the event and it will post the event to the actual member's account and affect your AR at that point. Most people will skip straight to the final billing tab though. And what this does is it posts all of your revenues and all of your taxes of any non-pre-posted items. So after you pre-post an event, you can actually add more items if you need to. And it will actually apply any payments and deposits and then create the charge of the balance to the member. So if I have a $20,000 event with $5,000 in payments, the member account will get billed for the remainder of the 15,000. So every event needs to be billed for it to show up in your GLs as well as for the member to get, a, to get it on their account. Under the billing tab, which you can see here, you have three steps. So the first one is your billing parameters, which is where you'll say, this is my date of record and this is what I want to bill. Step two would be select items to bill. So this gets a little bit more specific. You can actually bill certain items at a time. So maybe you're just going to bill them for the facility now. In a week, you'll bill them for the services once you do your inventory and see how much they actually consumed. Step three, preview postings. So it tells you exactly what's being billed up top. Down below, this would be your pre-posting summary. This would be your final posting summary. So you can see on the final posting, we have amounts coming out of function deposits. Um, and then right up top, we have our debit amount, which is going to your accounts receivable or the member. On this side, this account would actually be a holding account. You can see all of our revenue and our taxes, but nothing's being touched on the deposit side and nothing's going to get posted to the member. If you're happy with these postings, you can click on final post preview and then final post. Or if you're just coming into pre-post, you can click on pre-post preview and pre-post. You'll know if something's been posted because of this tab here, which has an audit number. So first of all, you'll have a checkbox that says posted. You'll also get an audit number. So that will be a BQ series audit number. The last thing I want to talk about is the other tab. So the other tab, you'll kind of jump around in between, but basically it's a way for you to cancel the function. So you'll change the stage. You can change it from tentative to confirmed, from confirmed to cancel. It's also a way for you to make a function exempt. So if a certain function is exempt from your taxes and your service charges and it's just specific to that function, that's where you'll go ahead and, and check that off. It's just under the other tab called exemptions. One thing uh, to note is the budget. So budgets is kind of an afterthought because not a lot of people do use it, uh, but it is a really great tool for you to be able to track your event profit and loss. Uh, it's not an official, it's not, it doesn't look at your GLs, it doesn't look at um, your budget entered in, in the core Jonas system under your general ledger module. It's just a way for you to kind of track uh, how much or what you have available for budgets. 
So based on the categories that you have set up and the, the items actually entered into the event, the budget amounts will populate on the budget calculation or it gives you the option to actually enter in the cost. So you'll set up your budget categories for say food, resources, facilities, and labor. And then you can actually enter in either what you're expecting to earn or just enter in the cost of those items. It uses what's actually attached to the event, looks at what you've entered in for the cost, and it gives you a profit. So this is what the budgets tab look like. You can see we have all of our different categories here. These two columns, quantity and unit price, are, are expected. So you can say maybe we've expected to sell 100 of these at $5. Then it gives you a budget total. So this is how much we're expecting to earn based on this. The revenue tab pulls from the actual event. So this is what's entered in as a service and a resource. The calculated cost is uh, you can actually set that up if you want it to say I want it to be about 25%, it will calculate that 25%-ish. Entered cost is free form entry. So you can actually go ahead and put in the entered cost of all of these things. So after you do the event, you'll do your inventory and figure out the real cost. It gives you the total for the expense, and then it gives you your profit. And down at the bottom of the screen, it gives you a full profit for the event. You can see this on the report that's called Profit and Loss Report. So you can see multiple events at a time. Speaking of reports, uh, these are some of your reporting options. So you have, there are tons of reports in there. I'll just go over a couple of my favorites. Uh, first of all is the Event Bookings Report, and there's also one called Event Bookings Financial. And they're two different reports, but they do pretty much the same thing. They're private functions, so where, when, how much, and the status of it. So it just gives you a listing of all your upcoming bookings. Um, on the financial report, it will show you the food amount, the beverage amount, the facility amount, and the resource amount. So it gives you kind of an idea, first of all, of what's coming up, and second of all, what your revenues could be like. The event charges report does the same thing, uh, but it gives you billings by type. Event listing is exactly what it sounds like. It just gives you a list of all your events coming up. Registrations gives you all of the attendees that are coming to a certain event, so you could print this out before you have a club event, just to give your servers or your hostesses a heads up as to who's coming. Event tasks, if you are using the task feature, this will give you all the tasks that are coming up and for which event, so it's almost like a to-do list for you. Payments and deposits is a favorite of accountants, and it just gives you all of the payments and deposits received and whether or not they're applied to events. The profit and loss report pulls from the budget information. So if you're not entering in information under the budget tab of events, that profit and loss report will be all zeros. And then you have your registration log, which is basically just an edit log of all the people that have registered. So you can see who registered certain members, who adjusted their registrations, who took them away. You can find all of these reports either on your modules toolbar underneath reports on your main ribbon underneath or on top of the reports option. And that is all of the content that I have today. I apologize, we did go over time. Uh, before I unmute the phones, I'm gonna go ahead and look to the chat box and see if there's anything there that I did not answer. And then I will go ahead and unmute the phones and allow for questions. Please, if you do not have any questions, mute your phone because there are a lot of you here and the background noise is going to be quite loud. Um, if you have gone ahead and put me on hold, please hang up instead. Don't put it on hold uh, because the hold music is very annoying and it takes over the whole broadcast. So I'm going to read the questions that are already in the Q&A or the chat. You can feel free to add questions here, but keep in mind that we'll be unmuting the phone so you will get a chance to ask your questions either way. So the first one that I have is on the table layout component, is there a way to ensure the room is to scale and can represent odd shapes of rooms? Yes, uh, on the table layout component, you can actually upload a background image. So the background image, basically what you do is you could create it in Microsoft Paint or you could actually take a bird's eye view picture. The background image, you could just have the actual shape of the room and that way you're not just using our generic rectangle. So you would upload the background image to show your actual room shape, and then you could place your tables within it. 
Um, all of the examples you are showing are a Windows type format. Our system does not look like yours. Is your system in Outlook mode view? Um, I actually am using the, what we have, we have a product called Encore, which has event management, and I am actually using that as my examples. And I'm only doing that purely because it was accessible to me when I started this presentation, uh, but it is the exact same thing. So this is how the Jam module looks. Um, so I'm, that question I'm a little bit confused about, so I might put that one on hold so that I can talk to you when I unmute the phones. Um, can you please show us what a BEO looks like when it's generated in the program? Yes, I can. Let's go back to my private event. So your BEO, um, of course, is going to be specific to your club. Not every BEO looks the same because you can have it made just for your club. This is just an example of one uh, that Jonas uses. So I'll use the Jonas standard event order and I'll just preview it here. So again, this can be totally customized based on your club. We can add your logo, we can structure it. Um, but this is just an example of what one would look like. Here we go, and they keep popping up on my, there we go. So we have, of course, uh, please ignore the top. This is just a, a template. I have not done editing, editing to this. You can definitely change this based on how you want it to look. But basically you have your booking information, you have your facility. So this is my facility and this event actually has set up notes attached. We have our food. We have all of our different, so our buffet dinner with all of our descriptions, our quantity, our price, and then our totals. More food, um, then we have our beverages. We have any other services, any resources. So these are our equipment rentals, our valet, our labor. And then we have a charges summary at the very bottom. So this is just a very generic one, can be totally customized for your club if you'd like, uh, but that's just kind of what the standard is, what Jonas kind of comes with. Uh, the next question I have is, many members want their private functions to be charged to a credit card. Can you show those steps? Also, can items, okay, that's a separate question, so we'll do that after. Um, okay, so the credit card, activity management does not actually charge credit cards within it. So what you would have to do is charge the credit card outside of Jonas, or charge it at your point of sale. And then we'll create a payment item in here called credit card and put the GLs in that. So that is a little bit more specific. So um, I unfortunately cannot go through the steps of that because I don't have a credit card processor set up. But basically what you need is to charge the credit card outside of Jonas just with your credit card processor. Within here, we'll have a payment item or payment type set up for credit card payments. And then it's the exact same as when you process a check or a credit card. Uh, the second question is, can items within the event be allocated to separate GLs? Yes, those items are all attached to sales categories, and those categories determine the revenue GL. So your food can go to one category, your beverage can go to a different category, and those categories can all point to different general ledger accounts. Um, the next one I have for member events, can it be set up so 50% of food costs can be applied to their prepaid minimums? Um, yeah, as long as the category is flagged to apply to minimums, that's a really good question actually, thank you for that one, I've never been asked that before. Um, as long as the category is flagged to apply to minimums and you are member charging the item, it's the same as a point of sale chit, so when it member charges it will do that apply prepaid minimums on their account. So yes, yep, it's all in the sales category. Uh, the next question I have is, is this a PowerPoint that can be emailed to us? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to email because there is over 100 of you, but you can download this PowerPoint and it will be available to you probably by end of day tomorrow. And it's going to be at jonassupport.com under resources and training and then club continuing education. So where you signed up for this webinar, jonassupport.com, resources and training, continuing education. The very bottom, there's a list of PDFs. You can see all of the PDFs that we've done so far this year for webinars, and then these ones will be added. Uh, typically at the end of the day, I email all four webinars to the marketing team and they upload them for me. And usually it's about a 24 hour turnaround. Is there plans in the works for a room rental to be set up as a food and beverage minimum where the costs are deducted from the room rental? 
Um, this question I'm also a little bit confused about, so I need to get some more clarification. So I will save that till when I unmute the phone. So please hold off if that was your question about the room rental being set up as a food and beverage minimum. Uh, the next question, our resource groups appear, but the actual resources do not drop down under the groups. How can we fix this? Oh, that's very strange. Um, your resource groups, when you're setting them up, so if we go to our event setup, and then our resource groups, and that's under system, sorry, system administration setup, and then resource groups, which is right here. Those resource groups, when you're setting them up, you actually have to check off what resources are eligible for the groups. So I would just double check and make sure that those resources are actually checked off under that group setup. Uh, the next question, how do you connect registered events to your website? Do you have more information on this? So uh, registered events to your website, you do have to purchase, there's a, a JAM event management module for the web side as well. And then you just need to put in your Clubhouse Online server information and then there is a sync that needs to be run and it shows up on your event calendar. Um, it is a little bit of an implementation process, so I can't go through everything with you, but uh, basically you need to have that module purchased and then you'll work with one of our web representatives to link it up and then it's just running its sync every once in a while to update people who register online and events that you've set up back office. Um, and then following that, do you have to have a Jonas website? No, you can sell that, or, sorry, you can buy that integration separately, so you can interface with a number of different website providers. Um, if we have an event with just a generic service like host bar, when you transfer charges from a POS that are item specific, for example, bottles or cans, will it create those items in the event or do you need to put all those individually? No, so when you transfer that chit, as long as those items belong to a category that can be used in activity management, and again, that's just a little checkbox on the category setup, you can transfer things in and it will just dump it right into the services tab. And for the person that's asking about their resource groups um, not showing up the actual resources, as long as they're checked, they definitely should appear. So that sounds like kind of a weird, uh, weird case. If you want to uh, go ahead and privately message me your club name, I can definitely log a call with support because it sounds like something's going wrong there. Um, and that seems to be the questions I've quieted down on the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute the phones if you have any live questions for me. Please remember, if you don't have any questions, mute your phone because the background noise does get a little bit overwhelming. Line unmuted. Okay, so line should be unmuted now if anybody has any questions for me at this time. Really bad feedback. I was the one who asked about the food and beverage minimum. Yes, okay, um, I'm just, I'm a little bit confused by what you mean by that. So do you want the room rental to apply to their minimum? Yeah, well, so we don't charge food and, or we don't charge room rental, we just charge food and beverage minimums for event bookings. And I know in a, a previous JAM webinar I did, there was a number of other clubs that asked the same thing. So could you create room rental where it would actually deduct the food and beverage sales from the room rental amount? Deduct the... So, okay, I just want to make sure I understand. So you have an event and you put in all of your services, food and beverage stuff, mm -hmm. um, and you have a room rental amount of, say, $1,000. You want yeah. the food and beverage amount to deduct from that $1,000? Yes, because we don't actually have a room rental. We just have a food and beverage minimum for that room. So, it, exactly, it's $1,000. So if you spend $1,000 on food and beverage, you pay nothing. But if you were to spend $500, then that room rental would actually end up being $500 because... Oh, okay. I and I think there was a lot of other clubs last time, I'm certainly talking like at least a year ago, um, that work on the same format. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if we've made any progress or you've heard anything about possibly that happening? I have not unfortunately heard anything about that. Um, but again, it's, I don't get to hear a lot of the development stuff, unfortunately. 
Um, I will put it. I'm gonna. That's a really good idea, actually. So let me check, let me look into that a little bit. Um, I'm thinking that it's taking so long because that would be difficult to program, like have it automatically deduct based on versus facilities. Um, but yeah, that's actually the first time I'm hearing about it, so that's a good. I'm gonna write that down. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, no, I do not have a status update on okay. that. Though. I will keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> Please do, because that's how you get things done. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions for me at this time? 